Hello, I'm David Mandy, president of O&M Partners. I want to welcome everyone to the GT Gold Corp Town Hall broadcast. A GT Gold trades on the TSX Venture under the symbol GTT, and it also has an OTC listing here in the States, GTGDF. For those of you that are new to these broadcasts, O&M um, has become the link between the non-deal, that means open market investing public, and, and public companies. Uh, past times, these groups passed each other like ships in the night. Our digital roadmap enables us to keep pace with the tremendous changes in investor demographics and how they receive information. We want this broadcast to answer all your questions. Questions will be easily answered by going to the question portal at GoToWebinar or by emailing us for any questions that remain unanswered. We'll follow up in a timely manner after the call. Uh, for those who dialed in with your phone, the only way you'll hear our pre recorded introductory presentation is on your computer speakers. If that's not possible, well, you'll be able to hear the main presentation after about eight minutes. So please stay tuned. Um, real pleasure to have uh, as our introductory speaker today, uh, Robert Keats, who is the editor and publisher of goldsilverpros.com. Um, Gold Silver Pros is a, it's a premium uh, subscriber digest, which emphasizes long-term cycle investing in the precious metals market. Uh, Robert is also the author of the 2010 book, Drop Shadow, The Truth About the Economy. Uh, Robert's hosting a North, the North American Monetary and Metals virtual conference in August, of which O&M is the proud sponsor. It's a great pleasure to turn the call over to Robert. Hi, everyone. This is Robert Keentz, the editor and founder of GoldSilverPros.com. GoldSilverPros.com is an online mag magazine specializing in the precious metals as well as the economy. I'm going to be talking today about the story of the Golden Triangle in British Columbia. What is the Golden Triangle? Well, it's outlined by the diagram you see here on your screen. It's so named for its rich gold ore deposits and also includes copper, silver, and nickel deposits. Currently, there are 24 junior explorers active in the region. Some of the largest projects you can see here are North Rock, Red Chris, Shaft Creek, Galore Creek, KSM, Valley of the Kings, and many others exist. Despite its rich resources, British Columbia receives very little investment compared to other popular Canadian mining districts, according to the Fraser Institute. It is in the bottom half of mining area regions in Canada for mining investment. Some of the reasons are that concerns exist over environmental regulations in the area, as well as the First Nations land claims, which are concerns for many mining executives in getting projects ready for completion. Despite this, though, the area has started to get a lot of renewed investment, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this presentation. First, I want to start off with some early discoveries in the Golden Triangle. It really starts with Premier. It was the first major gold discovery, the Premier Gold Mine, which opened in 1918. Premier Gold Mining returned investors over 200% between 1921 and 1923. Not to be outdone, the Stickeen and Calpine, Calpine Resources companies struck it rich with the SK Creek Mine. In 1988, the SK Creek mine struck 49 grams per ton gold, 2,406 grams per ton silver, along with rich deposits of lead and zinc. The SK Creek mine was Canada's highest grade gold mine. And the SK Creek mine ultimately produced 3 million ounces of gold and 160 million ounces of silver. Despite all this, the mine shut down in the 1990s. Despite being prolific precious and base metals producers, the relatively low metals prices of the 90s forced the closure of many of these mines. The cost of labor and power were simply too high. In addition, there was a lack of overall built infrastructure that raised the overall cost of mining for the companies operating in the Golden Triangle. However, changing economic conditions, especially the prices of the precious metals, have brought miners back into the area. For example, gold prices are much higher today than they were in the 1990s, even when indexed to inflation. And it means that the mines are more economic than they were 30 years ago. 
we're also going to be talking about some of the infrastructure that has been laid in the Golden Triangle. As you can see in the diagram, the road access to the area is easier than ever, and a new transmission line will dramatically reduce the cost of power for companies operating the Golden Triangle. Instead of operating off of diesel generators, they will be able to operate off of the grid. There's also paving of the Stuart Cassiar Highway, north from Smithers, Highway 37, and the completion of a $700 million high voltage transmission line to the Golden Triangle. Their Northwest transmission line goes 335 kilometers from Terrace to Bob Quinn Lake and north to the Red Chris Mine. You can see that this transmission line is connecting north to south across the Golden Triangle, offering mining companies easy access to electricity. In addition, I also wanted to point out that there's an opening of ocean port facilities for export of concentrate to Stewart, so that mining companies no longer had to truck out their uh, mining concentrates over rough roads to uh, various uh, facilities. I want to talk about a few of the major discoveries in the Golden Triangle. It really starts with the Valley of the Kings. Pritium Resources discovered 4.2 million ounces of gold at the Bruce Jack Mine. Not to be outdone, Imperial and Newcrest produced 71.9 million pounds of copper, 36,471 ounces of gold, as well as 133,979 ounces of silver in 2019 alone. And Seabridge Gold's KSM mine holds these impressive resources. 38.8 million ounces of gold, a robust 183 million ounces of silver, 10.2 billion pounds of copper, and over 207 million pounds of molybdenum. The growing triangle, the golden triangle has growing resource potential. So far, miners have found 130 million ounces of gold, 800 million ounces of silver, and over 40 billion pounds of copper. One highlight is Newmont Mining and Tech Resources' Galore Creek Copper Gold Porphyry, which hosts on its own 9 billion pounds of copper, 8 million ounces of gold, and 136 million ounces of silver. Not to be outdone, the Golden Triangle is rich in both nickel and silver, and especially in the northern part, which has nickel, silver, and lit a bit of lead and zinc as well. Dolly Varden Silver, for example, currently owns an 8,800 hectare property, and they see potential for five kilometer radius of potential additional deposits based upon the geology. So far, they have indicated resources at 3.47 million tons, 300 grand per ton silver, and 1.285 million tons at 277 grand per ton silver, which brings their total potential resource to 43.5 million ounces of silver. The resource rush is due in part to new geological modeling. The hydrothermal system responsible for most of the Golden Triangle's deposits have been active for over 10 million years, much longer than most similar systems in Canada or the general area. This is befuddled geologists who didn't know how to date or to track the resources and the geological formations in that area. Thanks to geologist Jeff Kaiba, his work has produced a new model for the area known colloquially as the Red Line where the geological contact between the Triassic and Jurassic age rocks are the strongest indicator for mineralization in the triangle. Indeed, most of the region's latest discoveries lie within two kilometers of that red line. But despite this, geologists feel that there is a lot more resource potential for the area outside of the red line, and they think it's going to be rich in gold, lead, zinc, nickel, copper, and silver as well. Thank you for listening to the presentation today on the Golden Triangle area of British Columbia. It is one of Canada's most prolific mining districts, and there are a lot of great companies operating in the area. We're going to see many more discoveries come about in the Golden Triangle, and I believe that the investment is going to be renewed in this area for Canada, and it's going to be a major source of resource for North America. This time, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to invite you to a very special event that we are holding August 6th and 7th, 2020. It is a virtual precious metals conference known as the North American Monetary Metals Summit. You can register for free online. And I wanted to talk about some of the speakers that will be there. We will have speakers talking about finance, many of the gold and silver companies, the precious metals, physical precious metals ownership, as well as many, many other sessions. We look forward to you joining us online. Thank you so much for listening to me give this presentation over the Golden Triangle in British Columbia, Canada. We think that that area has a lot of resource potential and we hope that you enjoy your feature presentation coming up here in a moment.
Thank you very much, Robert. It's a great introduction to the story, the GT Gold story. We're now going to turn to our hosts. We have um, Paul Harbage on the call, as well as Sean um, as Sean Campbell. Uh, Paul is a geologist. He has over 20 years of experience in mining exploration and development. Um, he most recently served as senior VP of exploration at Gold Corp from 2016 until the acquisition by Newmont um, in April 2019. Uh, prior to that, Paul successfully led the exploration team at Rand Gold, resulting in several very important discoveries. Uh, Paul has also been involved with research um, in collaboration with Kingston University and has comp completed two PhD theses as a supervisor, supporting two further PhD theses and two MSc projects. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have Paul presenting. We also have with us Sean Campbell, who's the Chief Financial Officer. Uh, Sean has over 15 years of uh, progressively senior experience in the mining industry. Uh, most re he most recently served as the head of investor relations with Gold Corp. Uh, so on that note, I'm gonna turn the call over to management. It's a pleasure to have you. Okay, well, thank you very much, David. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon to be able to talk to you about GT Gold and to talk about the newest discovery in the Golden Triangle following on from Robert's presentation. He's obviously a little bit out of date as he doesn't include, you know, our new big multi-million ounce uh, gold, multi-billion pound porphyry copper deposit. Anyway, before I start, I'd just uh, like to draw your attention to the disclaimer slide as we'll be making forward-looking statements in this presentation and within the Q&A session to follow. So as David mentioned, you know, I'm a geologist by education and explorer by uh, experience. And I've been very fortunate in my career to make some very big discoveries. I know what a world-class gold deposit looks like. You know, I found a number of them in West Africa. And I must say, it was a great experience working for Rangold Resources, you know, creating um, some of the most or one of the biggest value stories in the gold sector over the last 20 years now when i joined there were a dollar when i left there were you know a hundred million dollar company when i left there's 120 dollars and a 10 billion dollar company now i was then fortunate to come over to canada and work for gold corp in a global capacity and then when newmont um, acquired gold corp you know it wasn't my intention to join a junior, you know, no aspirations to be a CEO. But when I saw the rocks of uh, Saddle North, when I looked at the core with my experience, I immediately saw that this was a world class discovery and I had no hesitation in joining. And not only was it, um, you know, a world class deposit, I also saw immense exploration upside for more discoveries to be made. And I'll be able to take you through that story as we go forward. So turning to the highlights, as I say, you know, we, we found the, the most recent new copper gold porphyry probably in the world right now. And we've just, and in the space of just two and a half years, we've gone from first drill hole all the way through to a maiden resource with 9 million ounces of gold and almost 5 billion pounds of copper that, as I say, is located next to fantastic infrastructure. And we've also got property scale you know, uh, opportunities as well. You know, we've now got a very strong leadership, you know, that have worked for major companies, have made discoveries, taken them through the various study phases and created real value for shareholders. You know, we're fully funded, we've got over $14 million in the bank, that's sufficient to fund all of our exploration this year, as well as um, work into 2021. And we've got a very strong ownership by directors of management, as well as a, a key partner in, in Newmont at 14.9%. So as I said, you know, GT Gold is just over three years old. And in that time, they've made two significant discoveries, two targets tested, two discoveries made. That's a phenomenal hit rate. And the first discovery was Saddle South. That's a precious metal rich vein system, rich in gold and silver. And then very quickly on the hills, the Saddle North Gold Rich Copper Porphyry, which has really been the focus of the work over the last two years and has allowed us to come out with that initial mineral resource this last week. And as I say, you know, that 
uh, I saw that as being a mine. It's now about optimizing that to, to deliver the best uh, economic performance. And we'll be taking that through to PEA uh, as we move through the year. So where are we? So as Robert mentioned in, in his initial presentation, we're in the Golden Triangle uh, in the northern part. And we are certainly blessed by that excellent infrastructure. As you can see on the slide, the highway that Robert talked about, Highway 37 there, running uh, adjacent to the project site, just 10 kilometers away. You know, and this is not a remote project at all. I think there's a tendency to think that these large porphyry copper gold deposits are isolated. They're either at high altitude as in the Andes, or they're very remote and require huge capital projects to access them. Not the case with us at all. You know, we're just 10 kilometers away there. We've had um, some engineering studies that um, we can push a road in for just $2 million and access the site. And as well, we've got the hydro transmission line that you can see coming in that was part of the development of the Red Chris mine. And that was built with excess capacity with the foresight that there was going to be future mines in the area. And it's some of the cheapest business power in Canada at four cents a kilowatt. And you can just see the Red Chris mine, the infrastructure down on the on the bottom right hand side of, of this image. It's just 15 kilometers away. And at the project level as well, I think another important point, you know, we're in the weather window of the main coastal mountain belt of BC, which is further over to the west. And so in fact that that blocks the weather. We don't get the snowfall that a lot of other projects get, just a meter. So there's no permanent snow or ice, you know, no concerns uh, for developing this project. And and also at the topographical level, you know, we're only at 1,700 meters. No, no problems with altitude. And actually the topography lends itself to the development of this project. You know, with, with these changes in elevation up to 800 meters, we can tunnel in from the valley floor and be in the heart of the high grade. We haven't got to sink from surface. We haven't got to do a lot of switchbacks. And so very convenient for the development of this project as we, as we move this forward. Now here's our base of operations. It's a Swiss, a Swiss uh, chalet um, next to the highway, Bearpool Lodge. It's got uh, 20 bedrooms and, and comes with uh, 40 acres of land. And this is where we, we base our operation for the field. And then here's the project site, as you can see, you know, rolling topography. Um, there's a drill rig drilling on Saddle North. Um, you know, it's it's not a difficult terrain. It's not precipitous. It's it's rounded hills. Very easy to operate in this area. Um, you know, we we can operate year round, as I say, without the extreme weather. But generally, you know, our working time is is June to November, and we're already mobilised into the field, and we'll be drilling on some of our exciting new targets in the next few weeks. And I'll be able to talk about those targets um, in the next few slides. We've got a very clear dual strategy. One, it's about advancing the porphyry copper deposit of Saddle North. Now from that initial resource, um, uh, developing the mine plan and delivering that preliminary economic uh, study by the end of the year. And then the second part of the strategy is really exploring this exciting new uh, district that is, a, I think, a new porphyry copper district. It's never been explored before. I think, again, to remind you, no one had worked at all on this property in the past. You know, all of the work that is done here has been by GT Gold and there was never any drilling. Now, this isn't a, a project that has been around for decades and has sat on the shelf. This is a brand new greenfields discovery. And so let's turn our attention to that deposit. So here's an image on the side of, our, of the recent resource model. You can see um, the design of a, of a pit on there together with the, uh, the underground and all the drilling that's been completed. Now, the fundamental part for me in the resource business is a geological model. You know, how frequently do you read about a company having to restate their reserves and resources always on the downside? You know, there's impairments related to reserves resources. Why do companies miss their budgets? It all comes down to a lack of a geological model. You know, there's a lot of mineral models out there joining the assay dots, but it's about supporting that with all of the technical data. And it starts with the geology. And so coming in here, we brought that real discipline and rigor that a senior company is, does into a junior company to make sure that we can stand up um, 
to, to with these resources that we've just delivered. And so the key controls on this porphyry mineralization are the, are the lithologies and the alteration. So the grade, the copper and gold grade are intimately associated with the potassic alteration. The stronger the alteration, the stronger the gold and copper mineralization. So it was about using these shells, both from the lithology as well as the alteration to estimate the grades within there, making sure that we're not smearing high grade across low grade and we're giving you know, proper estimations that are realistic and then can be transformed into developing the, ro the, the robust uh, operating plan. And here's some core of that, um, of, of the porphyry. So you can see you've got complete textural destruction. You can see the mineralization and the veining that come through there that completely replace the rock and, and result in and the strong seconds, copper and gold grades. Paul, um, yes. did I miss you guys? Hello. Okay. Please continue, Paul, I'm sorry. Okay, so I just had an interruption there. Um, and so, you know, we, we have put all of the mineralization now into that, uh, we've got a global resource now of order mineralization and, and it's a big resource. You can see here, it's, you know, almost 300 million tons of indicated for 1.8 billion pounds of copper, almost three and a half million ounces of gold, and a further 550 million tons, uh, giving us almost three billion pounds of copper and five and a half million ounces of gold. So if you think from just first drill hole to this nine million ounce, five billion pound copper resource in just two and a half years, and here you can see, and, then, and within that, we've got this high grade core as well. Um, and so now having that global resource really gives us that flexibility to, to um, you know, develop the most uh, robust operating plan we can. And as you can see, it comes right up to surface and it extends down to depth. So it's got the open pit potential. Now, while this is uh, the maximum pit, it's not necessarily going to be the operating pit. We're now working to really optimize um, this resource to pull out. And, and give us the flexibility for what the best plan is. And, and so having that big global resource now really gives us that flexibility to do the trade-off studies between where an open pit should uh, continue to and then where an underground mine should start. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, an, an open pit is gonna be a, a, a key part of this, um, you know, upfront cash flow. Um, you know, it's not big capital. You know, as you saw, infrastructure is close by. And if you reference, you know, this is very similar to, to Red Chris, which is just 15 kilometers away. And that is a 30,000 ton per day open pit, which was put into production in 2015 at uh, between 500 and 600 million dollars. So this is not a big CapEx project. You know, this is not the billions of dollars. This will be several hundred million dollars and, um, you know, an easy path to development. I'm just going to hand over to Sean to show you the rigor and discipline that we put behind these resources using realistic prices that we've benchmarked. And I'll let Sean speak to you about these. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so I just wanted to go through some of the assumptions that we've used as part of this resource. Um, we really wanted to be able to have assumptions that we were standing, could stand behind and that could benchmark well against some of our peers. Uh, to point out that when you do this, you do a resource, uh, it's, it's quite common that when you're following it up with a PEA, you're selecting a resource price which can be higher than what your PEA price is. So we selected 325 as the copper price. And on a, when you compare that with other companies out there, and their resource price, you've got companies like Eero Copper at $4, Barrick and Newmont at $350 and $325, Capstone Mining at $350, Nevada Copper at $375. So we compare quite favorably to those prices, and I think we felt comfortable using that $325 for the resources. For the mining costs, we used a $2.30 mining cost, and there's quite a few examples of copper and copper gold mines, both in BC and Canada, that are operating anywhere just below $2 a ton Canadian to 
maybe 250 on the processing and GNA. Again, we don't have a mine plan, we don't have a PEA, so we don't have our throughput, which will drive some of those costs uh, on a per ton basis. But I think you can look at that Red Chris operation and it gives you a sense of the cost to operate in this region. From an underground perspective, we did make the assumption that it would be using a bulk underground mining method. There's more than just one bulk underground mining method. And I think that, that the best example to look at right now is probably New Afton. They've recently published a feasibility study or an updated technical report that outlines, and you can see from that, the process of doing these underground bulk mining uh, situations where New Afton first published a resource under one set of assumptions and then later followed that up and, and did a mine plan around first a block cave and then a sub-level caving. So again, at the resource, you've just got the one set of assumptions and it's later on, in the case of New Afton, it's through their technical report. In the case of what we're planning on doing is evaluating it through that PEA for what type of mining method could make sense. Um, but again, overall, we just wanted a defendable set of assumptions that we could then take forward to do our PEA work. Uh, if you could just flip to the next slide. On this slide, we've grouped the tonnage that we've got in our resource by net smelter revenue. And it, it's interesting in that when you go to a gold deposit, I think a lot of people have a, a sense or a number in their mind for what is high grade. And I think with a copper gold deposit, it's more complicated. It's more complicated because you've got the two metals, you've got different recoveries, you've got treatment and refining charges. There's just a lot more that goes into it that takes you from what's in the ground to what can be potentially revenue. So we thought if we showed a chart on a net smelter revenue that it would help people understand that after you apply those factors, the kind of value that is remaining in this rock so again, in the purple category, the over 60, the average net smelter revenue of that rock is over $70 a ton. And that's after you've applied these recoveries, after you've applied payabilities, that's the net revenue that you're seeing in those blocks. And that's over 70 million tons in that category. The next between 40 and 60 adds another 140 million tons at again, what I would say the industry would consider a very good NSR value. So again, it's, it's not just about grade, it's not about looking at something whether it's high or low, it's, it's really about the value. And, and that's what we're trying to show on this slide is the value of the, of the rocks that are in this resource. Thank you, Sean. I think the other thing to comment here as well is the continuity of the grade and, and how continue it is down dip, you know, this, this higher grade core is almost a kilometer and the flexibility that we have that the high grade is very concentrated in that core. It's not like we, we have um, areas of it all over the deposit, very concentrated. So we've really got the flexibility to, to mine a, a smaller, tighter tonnage um, zone of mineralization or we can flex that out and, and take more material as well. But, you know, that, that great continuity and zonation really gives us the, the opportunities in this deposit and, and, and pulling that out of that global resource. And furthermore, there's still a lot of room for expansion. You know, there's a couple of sections here, one to the northwest, one to the southeast. And actually the, the, the current mineral resource model is actually limited by just by the drilling. And so you can see that, you know, within that pit shape withdrawn, you know, if there's further drilling, we can certainly populate that area, you know, with, with grade. And, you know, certainly there's, there's no major concerns about, you know, the amount of potential waste in these pits. You know, as you can see how much how much mineralization is, is occurring already within that shell. And I think furthermore as well, you know, as we start to go deeper, you can see that the grades are starting to increase both to the northwest and the southeast. So with further drilling, not only can we expand this current resource beyond the 9 million ounces and 5 billion pounds of copper, we can also increase the grade and give us even more flexibility, you know, as we go forward. And so what are the what are the next steps now? Now that we've completed the mineral resource, uh, 
We'll be filing the, the detailed disclosure report for the 43101, the details or the, or the work on the mineral resource. And then we're anticipating the completion of that economic study to really optimize you know, that 9 million ounce, 5 billion pound copper resource that we've got. And that's due for completion at the end of the year. And now for me as an explorer, this is the exciting bit. And, um, you know, as Robert said uh, earlier, a lot, a lot to be found. And, um, you know, on the left-hand side is, this is our property. It's, a, it's the biggest single property in Northern British Columbia, uh, 468 square kilometers. You know, you can see our neighbors, you can see the Red Quist mine there, 15 kilometers to the Southeast. And, and in purple, are the two uh, properties that Newcrest, as you're aware, Newcrest came in and acquired 70% of red crisp from Imperial Metals um, last year. And then earlier this year, they acquired the, the property to the southwest of us, uh, GJ and Spectrum from Skeena. So, you know, they certainly see that there's a district play here and a busy consolidating land. Uh, and then you can see our two key target areas, uh, Saddle and Quash Pass. And again, why do we think this is an exciting district play? I think, you know, the, the key point is that these copper, gold, porphyries, you don't get one of them. They occur in clusters. And two examples are Newcrest Cadia mine in Australia. And, but again, these have got long histories, you know, first drilling 85, discovery in 92, you know, 30 years later, and this is what you see, six centers, you know, we've got multiple mining funds from open pit to, to underground. and and you know, look at the distance there, five and a half kilometers. And then you look at the center section, Red Crest. You know, that's been around for 40, 50 years. It's had a bit of a checkered history, but now Newcrest are in there. They're getting fantastic results out of the East Zone. They're busy permitting a decline. They're talking about that as Block Cave 1. Recent exploration out of the Gully Zone is Block Cave 2. So again, showing that there are these multiple centers. And then the bottom section, and here we are, you know, just two and a half years in, first drill hole, you know, this large resource. It's got a very strong geophysical response, as you can see there, with it, which extends over three kilometers. And you can see, you know, we haven't drilled, as I said, outside that envelope, a lot of runway there for more discoveries, more centers, and uh, certainly a lot of upside there on the exploration. And now I'm going to zoom into firstly the Quash Pass area where we're getting ready to drill. And, you know, this is real, you know, big scale anomalies. We've got, we've got two here, a northern seven, <laughs> continuous seven kilometer east-west anomaly underlain by a very strong geophysical anomaly. Big structures coming through here. These big <clears throat> northwest southeast structures are the ones that control mineralization in BC. They bring up those porphyry intrusions. We've mapped alteration at surface. We've got rock chips with co gold and copper mineralization. We see a lot of uh, malachite staining, you know, bright green. Um, it's got all the ingredients you'd look for in a significantly mineralized um, target. And not only have we got one, we've got two. We've got this northern one, as I say, and then the southern one here that again extends for six to seven kilometers. These are brand new greenfields targets, never been drilled before. This is the first work that's ever been done. You know, I can't wait to get some drill holes in and see what is driving the system. And, and our key goal this year is to, is to identify another significant mineralized system in the Quash Passer. So we're going to be starting off with 10 500 meter deep holes, 5,000 meters, and that should be starting in the next few weeks. So keep an eye out for the results. And then turning to the to the saddle area, uh, in in the centre there we've got saddle north. That's the porphyry. You can see the extent of the um, of the geophysics. And as I pointed out, to the northwest, the the mineralisation is open beyond hole 123, and you can see the the geophysics extending in a northwest orientation. And then as well as I showed you, mineralisation is open to the south uh, and following the extension of the geophysics anomaly. And then one, one uh, area we haven't spoken about is Saddle South. So that was the initial discovery. And as you can see here, it's that precious metal rich vein system, high gray gold. It's got no, no copper or very little copper. Um, and that's certainly got a value proposition. 
Um, but obviously, as a smaller company, um, you know, we didn't want to try and do everything. You know, the big the big prize was obviously the porphyry, putting all that together. But now, as uh, as we embark on our summer program, we've got 34,000 meters of drilling into Saddle South. We're going to be going through that discipline and rigor of relogging all of that core, putting together a geological model, coming up with um, a resource, and then looking to augment the PEA uh, of, Saddle, of Saddle North, bringing in Saddle South to the equation. And this has the potential to really add some cream to an operation. And as you can see, you know, it's, um, it's very, um, you know, a lot of visible gold. You can see there in the photograph in the core, you know, uh, very easy to extract the gold, uh, good um, uh, recoveries as well, over 90%. And, and sorry, one thing I did forget to say on, on the Saddle North, um, and it, you know, there's no issues on the metallurgy there. We've got a very clean concentrate. There's no deleterious elements, no arsenic, no mercury. As I say, very clean, very simple flow sheet, and we're getting very good recoveries. So, um, you know, all very positive. And then, as I say, you know, having been, uh, as a company only only exploring for three years and making those three those two discoveries you know we've still got a, a a lot of opportunity in and around saddle we've got a hole here 64 which occurs between saddle north and saddle south you know came back with significant gold and copper mineralization in porphyry but it was only a shallow hole 200 meters so certainly pointing that there's something else further at depth and, and that anomaly continues to trend along to the northwest. So, you know, certainly a lot more drilling to be done around here as we progress this project. So turning to social responsibility uh, and, you know, First Nations is a big topic in Canada right now. You know, we're fortunate we work, we work um, with, with one band, uh, one nation, the Toltan, we're in their traditional territory. Um, they're in the process of uh, finalizing reconciliation agreements with the province uh, and up front they state that they want a world-class mining business in their in their territory and you know we've seen big projects getting permitted whether it's the big open pit of of Red Chris uh, back in 2015 whether it's uh, Pretium's Bruce Jack Miner, you know, a big underground mine. So, you know, we don't see any concerns uh, around permitting. We have all the permits in place to conduct all of our exploration, all the all the, the drilling that we need to do. But again, it's all about engagement, respectful communication. You know, we continue to do our water sampling. We continue to do archaeological assessments as per the guidelines before we start drilling and certainly have a big reclamation program to clean up the area after we've drilled and worked there. As you can see, you know, nearly 30% of our workforce in the field is our Toltan employees. And even as a small company, you know, we are, we spend or put about $3 million into the local economy as well as funding additional projects. Uh, turning to our, our sort of equity structure and financial position and share ownership, I will hand back to Sean to take you through this. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so again, strong ownership from management and insiders. Newmont became a strategic partner last year initially with a 9.9% investment, but then increasing that to 14.9. In the last two years, in 2019, our shares were up 73%. This year to date, uh, with the current share price today, it's over 80% this year. From an analyst perspective, uh, following Paul joining the company in September, we had a number of analysts uh, start to cover the company, the most recent one being Industrial Alliance in May. And then we've got over $14 million in cash, which fully funds this year's exploration program and about two years in, of G&A. Thank you, Sean. And I think just, just to clarify then, you know, we're looking at a, a at approximately an $8 million exploration program, so a minimum of 10,000 meters, starting off with the 5,000 meters in the Quash Pass area. And we've got a further million dollars to spend for the PEA. And so, you know, I just thank you very much for your attention. We'll take some uh, questions, but, you know, it really is a, a truly exciting time to be at GT Gold, you know, to, to uh, have one of the newest gold copper discoveries in the world with a large resource and all of that exploration upside, you know, um, really fun time to be with the company and take this forward. Yeah, and to have such a great management team.
such experience and discoveries. So um, great, well, well presented, gentlemen. Um, I mean, we're going to start our questions today with Andy Carruthers in Dallas. Andy, question today? I think Andy's muted, Scott. Andy, you're on. Can you unmute yourself, Andy? Yeah, he's we'll self-muted. We'll come back to him. Yeah, we'll come back to Andy. Uh, let's go to Doug, turn to Doug Loud. Doug, question today? Doug? Doug, you're on mute as well. It's the second time that's happened. Okay, let's turn to Murray Vanderbilt, please. Murray, can you unmute yourself? Everyone's muted today. Strange. I'm going to send Murray an unmute request. I'm I'm hearing you. Here we here we go. There you go, Murray. Thanks, Murray. Good to have you on the call. Do you have a question today, Murray? Hmm. Well, let's turn to Robert Wallace. Um, Robert, do you have a question today for the team? Robert, can you unmute yourself? I think I have now. There you go. Thank yeah, you, Robert. Robert. We can hear you. Uh, she said, I'm very, very familiar with Skeena. I just wanted to you to contrast yourself with Skeena, if you could. Yeah, Robert, it's, it's a very different style of mineralization. That's more of a uh, volcanic mass, uh, volcanogenic massive sulfide deposit. So uh, it's got, you know, high grade gold polymetallic uh, mineralization you know we've got this uh, homogeneously mineralized disseminated um you know intrusive system so uh, very different very different and um you know really not comparable in in geological terms you know um, skin is more of a, a you know a narrow high grade uh, small tonnage operation whereas we're you know more bulk mining okay so no correlation or very little no correct. and then in terms of the project stage uh we're about a year behind them they came out with their pea uh late last year our plan is a pea late this year so in, in terms of the stage of the project uh we're about a year behind them and you're much uh near the ocean yeah uh no i mean we're we're sort of <laughs> Theoretically, up the road from um, from Skeena, but we, you know, as I say, we are very close to the highway. We're approximately a four-hour drive from the port of Stewart, the deep water port of Stewart. So very conveniently located for you know shipping out concentrate. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. We're going to turn to Stephen Shipman. Steve, question today. Uh, Doug Loud, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, let's go to Doug. Yeah. Interesting. I think they've changed WebEx or something. Um, this sounds great, but I always have to ask my favorite question. Can you discuss uh, the wonderful world of permitting and environmental studies and all that you have to go through to get further along the way? Yeah, certainly. I mean, we, we're certainly not at that stage yet. As I say, you know, we're in the exploration stage. We, we've got We've got valid permits to conduct, uh, you know, all of our exploration work, which would include it, whether it's soil sampling, whether it's geophysics, or whether it's drilling. You know, we're not we're not limited even to be able to advance to infill drilling or testing all of the targets that we've got within our portfolio. You know, actually initiating the the EIA is is much further down the line once we're at a more advanced uh, feasibility stage. But for now, you have all the permits you need to do what you're trying to do. Exactly, yes. Excellent, thank you. And the money to do it, thanks. Thank you, Doug. We now have Andy Carruthers uh, unmuted. Andy, please ask your question if you have one. Oh, yeah, I, I just sent you a, a, a question, uh, but uh, how did you acquire the property and uh, what is the total amount of uh, investment that's been made in the company? 
Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. So the 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 camp initially the there was an option made on uh, there was um, uh, some claims that were staked and that claim holder there was an option taken out on those properties under a company called. Uh, Newcris Minerals and then Newcris Minerals was uh, listed as GT Gold in late 2016. And to date, we've spent approximately $28 million. So, you know, in terms of, you know, dollar per ounce discovery, you know, we've been incredibly efficient. And Sean, if, if you can remind us of how much money we've raised and therefore how much value we've created for shareholders already in terms of our, our market cap today. Yeah, so, so in addition to the mineral property expenditures, there's been some G&A. But if you say we've, we've spent 35 million and we've still got 15 million in the bank, that means we've raised roughly $50 million against a market cap well in excess of 200 million. So uh, it's, it's been a very good investment, the, the money that we put into the ground on this project. Thanks, Andy. Thanks. Your question? Um, do you have a follow-up on that, Andy? No. Uh -uh. Okay. Thanks for being on the call. We're going to turn to Murray Vanderbilt. Murray, question today? Do you hear me okay? We can hear you, Murray. Absolutely. Yeah. So I wanted just to go back to... What do you think of the pit? Do you start it right away? What's the strip ratio? I, I, I want to study that NSR table you had. It was kind of interesting, but the grade's not that high, so it's a question of the overall cost to get at it. Yeah, I mean, I through, mean the, the resource, oh, through the resource process, you're really only selecting one pit. And uh, as you go through the different revenue factors, uh, the pit you ultimately select as the resource, you're comfortable that that is as, as large as it could possibly be. So that does drive a, a larger um, amount of, uh, like just a larger size, which you would assume incorporates uh, more material that's below your cutoff. That, that being said, it's really in the PEA where you, you look at your different alternatives within that and you develop a, a strip ratio. So, I mean, at this point, it, there, there's no, uh, real benefit in looking at the existing pit from a strip ratio perspective because you know you're going to be working within that. Okay, lastly, in the beginning you talked about there were other possibilities. I, I didn't, I missed how big your 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 footprint is and, and what might be outside this one particular resource, the Saddle North that you zeroed in. You mentioned Saddle South. I don't I don't know how big the area is, or where you may go after you get the cash flow to look around. Yeah, so so we've we've got the largest single property in this part of the world, 468 square kilometers. You know, it's a big land package. Uh, we've, you know, the saddle. You know, we've certainly got room for expansion around uh, saddle north. That the saddle south is this precious metal rich vein system. You know, which um, comes to surface. You know, certainly has economic benefits. We've got the quash pass area, which, as I said, were were two six to seven kilometer uh, anomaly. So if you combine them together, almost 14 kilometer anomalous trend to be following up. You know, we've certainly got a lot of targets, a lot of room for for additional areas to go and explore. And where do you fall in on this red line that goes through the triangle that was mentioned in the opening comments? Yeah, that's, that's the uh, what they term the unconformity and it comes right through the project. Actually, that unconformity is probably just several hundred meters away from the Saddle North deposit. Great, thanks very much. Thanks for your questions, Murray. Um, Steve Shipman, uh, let's tr go back to him. I see he's got, Steve, do you have a question? We're gonna unmute you. Steve, any yeah. questions? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't know what happened before, I apologize. That's okay, um, Steve, it seems like it happened to everyone. So we've got to figure something out here, but glad you could ask your question. Okay, I thought I had a target on my back. Um, I was wondering, gentlemen, um, are you looking to just explore and develop and then sell, or is the intention of the existing management and directorate uh, really looking to um, to produce? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. I think look. I 
you know, we're under no illusions that this is a large project. You know, it um, it would certainly fit into the portfolio of a senior company. You know, right now it's for us, it's all about de-risking the project, you know, creating shareholder value, you know, continuing to explore and make discoveries and adding value. And as we progress through the studies, you know, we'll, we'll advance our strategy. Okay, so uh, it's open-ended then, in other words. Yeah, I think we've got to be flexible. Certainly, if, um, if, if a senior comes riding over the hill and, um, you know, wants to acquire this project, you know, yeah. we're, we'd certainly be interested. Um, okay. You know, we've obviously got Newmont in there at 14.9%. They're a bit, you know, very supportive shareholder. They like the project a lot. You know, they yeah. also see this low capital intensity to development that, you know, you can get an open pit underway followed by the underground, you know, and they certainly see that, you know, this isn't billions of dollars. Yeah, the, it looks like your exploration trajectory looks like you, you're, you're setting up for a mine that can do 300 to 500,000 ounces a year. That certainly would, um, you know, suit a major. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And, and I think, I mean, interesting to follow up on that, because yeah. again, when you think about the majors, you know, the majority of them have got production cliffs coming in the next five to 10 years. You know, the M&A activity that we've seen in the market has all been about buying production. And the reality yeah. is there isn't the new discoveries out there. And as I say, you know, this is one of the newest discoveries in the world and it's got, it's got scale, it's got life. And, you know, these majors, whether it's gold or particularly gold now, want more exposure to copper. You know, they can balance the revenue stream and they can ride out these cycles. Yep, and have a land package behind it like you have. Um, okay, thank you. Good presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for being on the call, Steve. We're going to turn to Michael Potter. Michael, questions today? Yeah. Hi, Paul and Sean. Thanks very much for a fascinating talk. Um, what I'd like to know is, um, how does the gold um, correlate to the copper? Is it sort of a more or less constant correlation, or do you have distinct copper zones and distinct gold zones within the deposit? No, not at all. They're very much related, um, you know, sort of, yeah, there's, there's no, there isn't, you know, there's no, it's, you know, there's no leaching and no sort of super gene blanket of copper. It's very much, you know, gold and copper together. Okay, thank you. Scott has a few questions from the audience. We're going to turn to Scott Edmonds. Yeah, thank you. Um, the first question is, I would like to know why the approximate 1 million ounce in the Saddle South wasn't mentioned in your news release and when it might be mentioned and also why the resource in the Saddle North has not been given in gold equivalent ounces. Okay, thank you, good question. I mean, hopefully I covered that answer in, in the question. You know, the, the focus has been on Saddle North, putting that resource together. And I say Saddle South is gonna be coming. We are gonna be busy doing, following that same rigorous protocol that we did with Saddle North, putting the geology together, and then uh, the resource um, followed by, you know, looking to augment the PEA on Saddle South in 2021. So we'll be looking at starting that relog program, you know, in the next few months, and then and then put the geological model together, followed up by the resource. So it's certainly in our program going forward, but the priority has been Saddle North. In terms of, um, you know, equivalents, you know, this is where you have to be wary, wary of the regulators because, you know, th there's, there's a number of ways you can calculate the, the equivalents. Some people include recoveries, some people include them at, uh, at 100 percent. And, and therefore, you know, it, they can give misleading information. So, you know, what we did was was to put the factual information and then you know individuals can actually calculate the equivalents themselves great thank you uh, the next question is tailing storage going to be an issue as red chris may already have cornered the best locations uh, certainly not i mean the preliminary work we've done uh, you know the the Topography and landscape certainly lends itself to development. I say we've got 468 square kilometers of land to play with. Certainly a number of valleys that we could tuck tailings into, you know, and 
you know, the topography is very similar to, to Red Chris. That's on the other side of the valley, 15 kilometers away. So, yeah, no concerns around um, what we need in terms of infrastructural requirements. Great, thank you. Um, the next one, what is your, what is the strip ratio on your conceptual resource pit? Yeah, so all, all we've done at the moment is is sort of floated a, a cone. It's not a design pit. And and as it's a, a resource then, you know, at this stage, we can't quote an official strip ratio, but, you know, it's certainly, it's certainly going to be low and uh, and I remind you that you know that isn't going to be the final pit for for the operating plan we'll we'll pull um a pit you know out of there so you know we'd estimate that it'll be a very low strip ratio it's not it's not a concern to us great thank you and the final question coming from the audience is can you um can you comment on why the market hasn't reacted more positively after the new resource estimate? Yeah, I mean, our, our share price has performed exceedingly well. I mean, it was up 73% last year, up another 80% uh, this this year so far. You know, we're, we've been very happy with the performance uh, of our stock. And I think, you know, when when there's some new information, it always takes time for for people to digest it and understand it. And uh, you know, I think you know, once that's uh, started to happen, then you've seen uh, you know the strong response to that. Um, you know, as we've gone later into the week. All right, I think one is coming in just now. Um, one second, please. What grade do you think is required to justify a a bulked underground mine? Yeah, um, look, again, that will depend on the studies. Uh, I think there's a, a lot of authors out there that suggest, you know, around about the 1% the copper equivalent. Okay. But certainly, you know, the grades that we're seeing more than match uh, and if not better than than operations within, um, you know, BC. I mean, if you just looked at the graph with the plus 60, um, 60 dollar NSR, that's significantly bigger than than the new Afton operation. Excellent. Thank you. Well, that's the questions from the audience. OK, we'll proceed to close. I want to remind. Um, our, our generalist investors new to the mi new mi to mining stocks there's a such a thing as the Lasan curve which really describes the life cycle of a mining stock and the two real inflection points where value is created is with the drill bit at the beginning and of course cash flow at the end when they go into production so we're really at the in the sweet spot of the first part of the Lasan curve where the drill bit, bit creates value so it's a real pleasure to have Paul and Sean here today. I want to thank everyone for your attendance. I'm just going to turn back to management for any closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you all this afternoon and to be able to showcase, you know, the newest uh, gold-rich copper porphyry in, in British Columbia uh, and together with one of the biggest maiden resources in the world right now. So, and, um, you know, please, uh, Keep watching as we start drilling our new targets and, and we further advance this exciting project. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Paul and Sean. And just to be, um, please text in your questions if you have any further questions. And also be aware that this, this uh, broadcast will be aware on demand. Um, so if anyone wants to hear the presentation again. I wish you all well, pleasant evening. Thanks again.